Good afternoon. We have our first talk uh, that will be a presentation by Yelan Ramaye. He's a security researcher at Kadelsky Security, focusing on cryptography. He's spoken at Black Hat USA, DEF CON, and others. Um, please, a warm welcome for Yelan. Hey, um, hello. I'm super happy to be here today. So uh, my talk will be about uh, one key to rule them all. Um, it has a subtitle in the program telling you it will be about uh, elliptic curve math tricks. And uh, it should not scare you, because you were there last year at NSEC when uh, Martin gave his uh, getting ahead of the elliptic curve talk, right? So you all know everything about elliptic curves. Nah, I'm kidding. So an elliptic curve is just a set of points, basically, which satisfy certain uh, equations. Here is the uh, Weierstrass equation, and uh, I require the elliptic curve to be non-singular, but you don't really need to know all of these today to understand the talk. Which is super important, though, is that you understand that those elliptic curves, even addition law, a group law defined on the um, curve, which is well-behaved. It does what you expect it to do when you add two points together. It gives you a third point on the same curve. And now about elliptic curve cryptography briefly. Um, you've seen this morning that uh, elliptic curve cryptography is almost dead, right, in the post-quantum talks. But nowadays, it's almost a big, um, it's everywhere. Uh, you can find elliptic curve cryptography whenever you connect to a website and so on. And elliptic curve cryptography is usually working with a subgroup of prime order M, a huge prime order. Um, of the elliptic curve C we just defined. And we have a point on the curve which we call the, gener the generator or the base point G. And everything is done in that subgroup, so it's important. Now the security of elliptic curve cryptography is based on this discrete logarithm problem, the LP, which have nothing to do with the data loss prevention, right? And the DLP basically tells you that if you have a point Q, which is equal to n times a point P for n a scalar, an integer, um, it is super difficult to find the value of n if you are only given the points P and Q. Okay, I might have been a bit faster, so what's scalar multiplication? It's exactly what you expect it to be. So. 2 times p, the point p, is just basically p plus p. 3 times p is p plus p plus p, and so on. And by definition, the scalar multiplication is distributive over the addition. And this is the main point of this talk. Everything which I'll present you today is made possible because when you do a times p plus b times p on an elliptic curve, it is equal to a plus b times p. So that might sound a bit scary, but it will be clearer in a little bit. All right, so um, we've seen the discrete logarithm problem, and now about elliptic curve schemes. We have mostly uh, signatures like ECDSA, uh, key exchange like ECDH, and we can even do encryption sort of with a hybrid crypto system such as ECUS where you will encrypt with a symmetric key algorithm but you will share the key using a public key algorithm based on elliptic curves. So I've just said public key. So what's a public key and what's a private key? Well. Elliptic curves cryptography is usually a public key crypto system where the private key is simply an integer, so it's a value k. Um, here I say it's smaller than p because I want it to be a an element of fp, the finite field um, of dimension p, for p a big prime. But it's none of your concern, it's just like the details behind, you know, the stuff the cryptographer will deal with. And a public key, then, it's a point P on the curve, which is computed using the private key K, multiplying it with a generator, which has been decided by NIST or standardizing bodies or whoever made up the elliptic curve you are using. Or maybe you can choose a point to use as a base point yourself and just multiply it with the integer K. And you will get a point P equal to K times G, which will be on the curve. So 
private key is an integer, public key is a point on the elliptic curve. That's the main point here. And now that you know that, I can go ahead and tell you a bit about Bitcoin. You all know about Bitcoin, I guess. And Bitcoin is using ECDSA, the signature scheme, to basically sign its transactions, but also to uh, generate the addresses. So when you send Bitcoins to somebody, you are actually sending the Bitcoins to the hash of a public key. And this is important because since it's using elliptic curve cryptography, it can rely on all the nice uh, structure the elliptic curves have behind the scene. And somebody, Peter Vuel, proposed the idea of hierarchical deterministic wallets a while back. And this idea is basically that you can use the math um, to derive child keys for elliptic curve schemes out of a master key, a parent key. And this has been actually implemented uh, in Bitcoin, and it's used nowadays to derive child keys. So as I told you, the public key uh, is just like what you will hash to get the addresses in Bitcoins, and you can do some magic tricks with those uh, public keys. Like you can take a public key, which is a point, P equals to K times G, and you can take an integer R and multiply it with the base point G. You get the point R times G. What happens if you sum P, the public key, with those, this newly generated point um, R times G? Well, you just get another point on the elliptic curve, Q. And what is super interesting is that this elliptic curve point is actually the public key corresponding to the private key given by K plus R. That's by distributivity, as I just explained you a couple slides before. And this is super powerful because you can use this ID to have one master uh, Bitcoin address, kind of, and derive other keys that you know you will know the private key of just by knowing the value R. And anybody can send you money to you know new addresses and so on. And that's something that has been implemented in Bitcoin in the BIP32, so Bitcoin Improvement Proposal. I might have skipped some details, you know, <laughs> but it's not too important. The idea is really that you have a private key, which is, which is an integer. In BIP32, they have extended keys, where they have an extra value at the end of the uh, private key, which will be then used as a hashmac key to hash the public key on some um, index to produce a random value, a pseudo random value, which is deterministically generated by the hash mark, you know, uh, R. And this value R will be then added to your public key to generate a child key for your uh, parent key. And um, it has been implemented, it is in use in most uh, Bitcoin wallets because it allows you to basically have multiples, uh, multiple wallets at once with just one uh, private key you can handle different addresses and uh, sign the transaction as you need. And this is all based on the idea that P plus R times G is equal to K plus R times G. There are a couple things I've skipped, like the idea of Arden keys and so on, but it's not too important for what I want to present today because what I've been thinking when I've read about BIP32 is, oh, that's a nice idea, actually. What can we do with these? beside Bitcoin addresses. And uh, where do we use public keys, actually? Uh, who amongst you has already signed on a server using SSH keys? Most people, right? Who has been using uh, PGP? Or who has been using modern uh, VPNs, such as WireGuard, and so on? All those services or um, tools are relying on elliptic curve keys sometimes. So it's not always mandatory. You can use RSA instead or something like that. But for SSH, for example, nowadays you have a lot of um, public keys which are based on elliptic curves because they are smaller in size. 
And uh, actually, uh, the last research we've done with one, one of my colleagues was about scanning the internet to collect all the keys we could find out there. And we can see that uh, SSH keys are mostly relying on one curve, SEC P256. And um, that curve uh, 25519, a really nice curve designed by DGB, um, which is being used by EDDSA, is not really used in practice. And that's a good thing for the stuff I will present you now, because with EDDSA, you can naturally do the same kind of tricks I just presented you, because you need the, in the private key will be hashed before uh, producing the uh, integer you multiply with the base point. So you will have to compute a pre-image, which is not something you want to do. So that sounds fun, right? Deriving new public keys out of a private, uh, of, out of a previous um, public key. So what could we do with that kind of stuff? So the idea is that you could basically publish your public key, and uh, if somebody wants to add your SSH key on a server, but don't want to, you know, if somebody finds uh, the public key, you will know it's yours or something like that. He doesn't want that. He could just put a new public key generated by adding a random value times G to your public key. And if he sends you the random value he used, you could then compute the private key which corresponds to that public key he generated because you know the private key of your own public key. And this is the idea behind what I'm going to uh, show you shortly. So it's called One Key, and basically it's a tool which will take a SSH key, and uh, SSH keys can be uh, elliptic curve based. So I'm using a SEC P256 um, R1 uh, public key there. And you can use one key to derive new public keys in practice. So it's basically to showcase it's working, what I just said. So let's do these. Mm -hmm. Not what I wanted. OK. So one key is uh, made in Go. You can get it on uh, GitHub, actually. And um, it's quite easy to use. You give it a key. Like here is a test key, and you give it a deriv what I call a derivation code, and it will produce an integer r, which is here the derivation integer as I call it. You can see it here, and basically the public child key here is the public key which corresponds to the test ECDSA public key plus. C1, B69, and so on, times the base point of the elliptic curve I'm using there, so P256. And this is nice because it works here with a private key, but actually what I could do is just here uh, take the public key and do the same thing. And you can see I get the same public child key here. And what I can also do is take another value uh, as a derivation, uh, because test two is basically what's getting hash macked with a secret value, which I'm not showing on screen. Uh, it's in a config file, basically. And you can see here, the, when I change test to test two, the derivation integer changed. And this is the value R you are adding to your public key times G to get the public child key. And now that's cool, but you know, you need the private key, right? So what you can do is basically just like if you were plugging a um, key or something, a smart card in your computer, you can add keys to your SSH agent, which is nice because you can derive the keys, add them to the SSH agent, and then you can just use SSH as you would usually. So now you have one master SSH key, and you can derive new child keys on the fly, in memory, without writing them on your computer whenever you need them. So here I will use a dash Q, and uh, this will not work because I use the public key. If I use instead the um, private key, uh, let me maybe show you, okay, that's what happened. So what does it mean? It means that my SSH agent 
got a new key added to it, which is called child key test two here. And if I want to add another key, I can test three. And the SSH agent just got a child key test three key added to it. And that's key, that key is not persisted into memory. And uh, let me remove all those keys. So I just got the keys I usually have. Uh, SSH. Okay, let me try and connect to some server. This should not work. Uh, maybe my internet timed out. Demo effect. Ha, ah, too bad. So the ID was on the server I'm trying to connect to, I have a public key in the authorized keys which correspond to the test to uh, child key. And uh, I could connect to it if my child key is added in my SSH agent, but I couldn't if it's not added to the SSH agent. So let's go back to the slides. Um, you can use it today if you want. Um, one key is a puck, but it's on GitHub. You can go and get it with go get, and uh, you can play with SSH keys. Uh, you might ask, eh, what about security, you know? What happened with those child keys? Well, um, there are two things. The first thing is a child key is not weaker than the private key you use as a master key because both are relying on the same hardness assumption, which is a discrete logarithm problem. So if somebody is able to break your child key, you will have been able to break your master key in the first place. Now, what happens if you have a child key and somebody is able to get the private key corresponding to that child key? Well, if he also knows the public key of your master key, and he knows the value R you use to derive the child key, he could recover the um, master key because K plus R minus R is equal to K, right? So that's just plain math. So the private keys are integer, the child key, the, ch the child private key is K plus R, if I know the value R and I know the value K plus R and I know how it has been derived, I can just compute K. So you don't want your private key to leak, right? Um, obviously. So BIP32 has a workaround uh, to avoid this using hardened keys. I haven't implemented it for SSH because uh, it's just a POC, just a pack, but anyway. Um, what's interesting here is that you could imagine something the other way around. So you have a master public key, which you use on all your machines, and whenever you get a new machine, you can generate a new private key, K, and you can compute the difference between your master, a uh, new private key, uh, yeah, anyway. You can compute the difference between your new key and your master key, and that difference will be the value R, and once you've computed it using, you need to know the both private keys to do so, then you can derive your master key out of your child key whenever you need it. So it can be seen, you know, either as a feature allowing you to derive the, the master private key when you need it, and never persist it in memory on your other machines, or it can be seen as a problem if you leak it and the value R you use is also leaked. Um, what could we do with, that, with these kind of IDs? Uh, it really depends. So uh, my first idea was to do a WireGuard key distribution uh, method because WireGuard uh, is a really cool uh, modern VPN and I like it. And I've seen a lot of people complaining about the lack of uh, PKI and the key distribution method for it. But um, it uses ED25519, uh, which is hashing the private keys, which makes the ID here a uh, bit more difficult because you will need to modify the way WireGuard is using the private keys so that you will use the integer directly and not the hashes, which is not really a good ID. Um, 
another idea I had with this is that you could imagine some sort of unnest ransomware, where basically you the ransomware, it's really um, uh, mean, it encrypts all your files with public key cryptography. And then when you want to get your files back, you will basically have to send money to an attacker. But if you send money and it doesn't send you the key, you're a bit sad, right? So you don't want that to happen. So the idea will be basically you could send the money to some trusted third party like, let's say, a smart contract on a blockchain, you know, not really a trusted third party, but a workaround to everyone. And if the, the smart contract is able to derive the same uh, child keys out of the private key the attacker will send you, it could then deliver the money to the attacker or stuff like that. I'm going to write a blog post about it at some point. It was a fun thought project we had at some, uh, with some uh, colleagues uh, at, at EPFL anyway. So um, other things you could imagine is um, to have disposable keys where you, know, you have a public key out there, I don't know, like on uh, GitLab or GitHub. You can see anybody's uh, public keys on GitHub by simply typing github.com slash username.keys. And you see the public key people are using, which is, you know, privacy-wise a bit bad because maybe you can link some identities with some other uh, nicknames by looking at which private keys, uh, which public keys they have on their profile, which is not something you want, right? But what you could do is have a derived key out of your master uh, key. And if you want at some point to prove it was you who owned both private keys, you could give the value R, which is the difference between the two private keys, so that anybody could verify out of the public keys that one public key derives into the other public key. So it's kind of like opt-in and reputability for SSH public keys on the internet. Not sure it's a thing, but might be done right. Um, so yeah, just try it out. Um, as you can see, elliptic curve and uh, math are not so scary. You can do cool things with them. And uh, yeah, if you have ideas, just try them out. It works out well sometimes. And mind your keys, keep them encrypted, because as I said, if you have a child private key leaking, it might compromise your master key, and that's bad. So um, encrypted um, keys are supported by one key, if you want to try it. And anyway, so uh, the, the uh, mass collection of uh, public keys we did with one of my colleagues is actually there to help you check if your RSA keys can be batch factored. You can test them on keylookup.co.security.com if you want. And uh, you can get the one key software on GitHub as well. And I'll put the slides on Twitter and my homepage at some point in the future. Um, so I don't know if anybody has questions. Anyone has a question? Thank you. Um, that was really interesting, and I can see lots of interesting things to play with here and, yeah. and explore. I'm just wondering, uh, is this notion of deterministically deriving keys from a master key, I could very easily be mistaken, but isn't this what happens inside a U2F device? Or uh, is that a different mechanism for creating uh, uh, new key pairs? In which uh, devices? In, in like a Yubico or Yubi oh, yeah. kind so of thing. So as far as I know, the current devices which are uh, using, which are being used for uh, 2FA and stuff like that, like you have the brand new uh, Fido2 uh, authentication method, which is also based on elliptic curves, is not using that kind of method because they need space to store the key and they just generate new keys on the device. Uh, I might be mistaken, though. But there are devices out there which are using this method to derive new keys. It's uh, uh, basically the Bitcoin ledgers and the Ethereum ledgers. So uh, all those, you know, hardware wallets, they usually implement BIP32. So the ID is out there. I'm not sure whether the uh, constructors of um, 
uh, two FA devices are actively using it. If not, they should, because it allows them to basically derive as many keys as they want. They don't need to store the private keys on the devices anymore. They can just derive them out of a master key they will generate at first use or something like that. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Another question. Thanks. So you had um, kind of two ways to uh, compute the deriving factor R. Um, so in the command line tool, it uses the HMAC method using a key that you said was in some configuration file somewhere. But uh, it seems that a lot of the applications, like if I want to make a derived key for you, I obviously don't know that HMAC key and I have to use the raw R itself. So under kind of what are the use cases of using the, the HMAC with a little short, easy to remember string versus when do you have to use the full R and remember some big number? Yeah, so the idea here is really that if you want to just use it to populate your SSH agent, you can do it easily with large R values by just using HashMac and deriving the integer in that, using that. But um, if you want to generate the key, the public key for someone else to use based on their own public key, um, what you can simply do then is you generate it as you want, the integer, or you can hash mark it with your secret value, and then you need to release the value R. You need to tell the people the actual value you use for R. Um, currently, um, BIP32 and also uh, one key are in using the public key of your master key inside of your uh, of the hash mac to have some link between them but um, that's why in uh, the de demo maybe i want to be too quick there but you can see um, when you generate a key just like test it's outputting the actual derivation integer which you can then use instead of uh, using test2 I could use dash uh, r, and I can give directly the um, the value r to it, and it will derive the same key. So, in the, but in in the Bitcoin setting, you don't generally know someone else's public key. You just know the hash of their public key until they use it. Yes. Right. So then. You can't do any of this until um, or unless Yeah, in the Bitcoin the settings, policy. the idea is not really to have somebody else generating the uh, wallet for you, is that you can yourself have a web application, for example, which will generate new public keys for you to for unlock later wallet. without knowing your own private key. So if you have a Bitcoin, uh, uh, if you have a website selling stuff, and accepting Bitcoin, they might not want all transactions to link to their main uh, Bitcoin wallet, you know? They might want each transaction to go on its own wallet so they can monitor it and see whenever it came and if it came, give you the stuff you bought. So um, it's not the same kind of use case, I will say, but yeah, it's correct that in the Bitcoin case, it's not as straightforward or as uh, here. Um, I would just uh, strongly recommend that for the case that you demoed, instead of just using an HMAC to get from effectively a password for deriving R, that you also put in a strong, um, you know, password, you know, a PBKDF2 or its successors. Yes, so the secret value has to be strong if you use the secret value as a, as a key for HMAC because otherwise it's not really secure, you know, so I recommend either using big random value as your secret, or yeah, I, I could maybe implement some kind of uh, key stretching so that weak passwords will be better, but yeah. Anyway, that was just, you know, for the puck. If you want to 
play with it, you can. It's open source. All right. We have time for one more question, if there's one more. Okay, thank you.